Okay, I think we should get started. Okay, guys. Uh, oh yeah, so uh, welcome everyone to the 2022 Dionoia Annual uh, Seminar in Ethics and Metaethics. Um, my name is Kyle Bloomberg. Uh, I'm a research fellow at uh, Dionoia and uh, I'm one of the co organizers of this event. And I'd be really pleased to have um, Professor Susan Wolf speak for us. Um, I want to run through a few things about Dianoia and about the seminar before we start. So, uh, Australian Catholic University uh, established the Dianoia Institute of Philosophy in April 2019 to build a world, world leading research center in uh, analytic philosophy. Our name comes from the Greek word Dianoia, which means thought, and is used by Plato in the Republic to denote the reflective and discursive reasoning that leads from mere opinion or doxa to uh, knowledge or understanding, which is news. And in 2021, we inaugurated annual seminars in four areas of philosophy, uh, logic and language, metaphysics and epistemology, social and political philosophy, and uh, ethics and metaethics. And uh, there are just a few uh, notes before we begin our seminar. So the first thing is that uh, this event is being recorded. And uh, after the seminar, it's going to be uh, made available uh, on our website. So you can get that online. Um, also, Professor Wolf's talk uh, will go for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a little bit of a break and there'll be Q&A for about an hour. Uh, and then finally, it's our custom here at uh, Australian Catholic University to give an acknowledgement of country. So um, we commence our meeting by acknowledging the first peoples and the traditional custodians of the country where Dianoi is located, the Wurundjeri peoples from the Kulin Nation. We respectfully acknowledge their elders past and present and remember that they've passed on their wisdom to us in various ways. Let us hold this in, our, in trust as we work together and serve our communities. Now uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker. So, uh, so Susan Wolf is Edna J. Curie Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She works chiefly in ethics and its close relations in philosophy of mind, philosophy of action, political philosophy and aesthetics. Her interests range widely over moral psychology, value theory and normative ethics. Her talk for us today is entitled Freedom for Humans. So please join me in welcoming Professor Wolf. Thank you. Uh, well, I thank the Illinois you know, Institute for inviting me and all of you for coming on this rainy day. Uh, I will just proceed. Can you hear me? Do I need to? I should get close. Is, is that better? Uh, 
we can hear you online. Uh, yeah, you can move that one. Okay. Yeah. For centuries, people both within and without the academic philosophical community have worried about the problem of freedom and determinism. A common form of the problem is expressed in the thought that if determinism is true, then with respect to anything we do, we lack the ability to do or have done otherwise. And if we lack the ability to do otherwise, the worry continues, then it is wrong or unfair or inappropriate to hold us responsible for what we actually do. The thought is that if determinism is true, then we can't help but do what we actually do, or to put it another way, that we are not in ultimate control of what we do. And so it seems we are not ever responsible for anything. The claim seems especially strong and intuitive when we are thinking of bad actions and consequences, where the question of whether we are responsible is identified with the question of whether we are deserving of blame and punishment. And yet, among the individuals that we tend to hold responsible for harms are corporations, nations, and other organizations. We blame Boeing for launching a plane that has a defective maneuvering system. We blame DuPont for dumping toxic chemicals into the water. We blame our governments for surveilling us without our consent. And it seems absurd to think in these cases that if determinism is true, our blame ought to be withdrawn. In determining whether and how much to hold the relevant organization accountable, it is relevant to us whether that organization knew or was in a position to know what it was doing. Whether, for example, Boeing was aware that the system sometimes malfunctioned or DuPont knew that the chemicals it was dumping were unsafe. It is relevant that if the organization had chosen to incur the costs, say, of further equipment testing, or building a leak-proof silo for its toxic waste. Your video is a little bit blurry. Um, it's coming over Zoom. Are you? Able to, I think you need to, move? to like move. So, tell me where to go. Just want to make sure people over Zoom can see well. Sorry. Oh, there, there. It looks like it's. Is this better? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Repeating. Uh, it is relevant that if the organization had chosen to incur the costs of further equipment testing or of building a leak-proof silo for its toxic waste, it could have done so. But it is not relevant that for all we know, determinism is true and that therefore it may have been metaphysically determined that the organization could not so choose. Though there is then some sense in which organizations must have the ability to do otherwise, in order to be appropriately and fairly held responsible for the damages it causes, it is not a sense that is threatened by the truth of determinism. If an organization's responsibility for its actions is not threatened by determinism, however, and this is something that everyone acknowledges, why has it seemed to so many people over so many years that a person's responsibility for her actions is threatened by determinism? An answer, which many people will be inclined to give, is that it is because when we ask whether a person is responsible for her actions, we are thinking about responsibility in a different sense. But in what sense? A few philosophers following Gary Watson have distinguished between two kinds or senses of responsibility, which Watson labeled accountability and attributability. Oh, it's not moving. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> to hold someone responsible in the accountability sense is to expect her to meet certain standards or abide by certain norms in such a way that should she fail to meet those standards, it is regarded as appropriate to blame her, administer, to administer certain sanctions or to harbor certain reactive attitudes such as resentment or anger or indignation toward her. To regard someone as responsible for some, something in the attributability sense, in a version of this concept that I would support, is rather to see the individual first as a self like us, a being with a point of view or sensibility or take on the world that has been formed and is continually open to revision by the individual's faculty of perception, imagination, reasoning, reflection, and so on. And second, to see the 
object of attribution as an expression of the individual self. In the first part of this lecture, I shall argue that the answer to the question, why does determinism seem to threaten the responsibility of human beings, but not the responsibility of organizations, has to do with the fact that while the responsibility at issue in the cases of organizations is merely accountability responsibility, the responsibility of interest in the, in the case of human beings concerns attributability as well. But judging from the way the issue has been discussed in the past, that is not the answer that most people who are concerned about responsibility and determinism are likely to give. Nor indeed is it anywhere in the neighborhood of their customary answers. On the contrary, most people who worry about responsibility and determinism are worried precisely about accountability, about the appropriateness or fairness of blaming or sanctioning someone who behaves badly or wrongly on the hypothesis that everything is determined. And they worry about this despite the fact that the worry does not seem to extend to the accountability of organizations. To explain this, they are apt to suggest that there are two kinds of accountability. We may call them shallow accountability and deep. The accountability of organizations, they might say, is a thin and shallow thing, justified pragmatically for the benefit of society as a way of deterring organizations from hurting the community and of recovering costs when damage is done. But the kind of accountability we are concerned with with respect to humans is different. If it is justified, it will license an angrier, more pointed kind of blame, a kind that it would be more hurtful for a person to receive, perhaps, than the kind we direct towards organizations, whose appropriateness does not depend on the usefulness of the practices of, of, the practices of accountability and sanction. If a person acts badly in some relevant way, the blame would be simply non-pragmatically deserved. And it is this kind of accountability that seems threatened by determinism, and indeed, as some go on to say, by indeterminism as well. This, I submit, is the way philosophers and philosophically minded people have thought about the problem of responsibility for generations. But while I grant that the character of holding, pe of holding people accountable for be bad behavior is often different from the character of holding organizations accountable, I think the idea that this reflects two different kinds of accountability is mistaken. Rather, I believe that there is just one kind of responsibility. Something has gone on here, sorry. That there is just one kind of responsibility, but its significance varies according to the type of agent whose accountability is in question as well as with the explanatory reasons behind the agents behaving as she does. To persuade you, I wanna consider a kind of case of human accountability that tends to get little attention. Typically, when we think of holding someone accountable, we focus on cases where the person's behavior expresses her values or character. She lies to you or steals from you or pushes you aside, perhaps because she just doesn't care or doesn't care enough about your interests as compared to hers. You are inclined to be resentful, full of blame, and you want her to feel your anger. But thinking about determinism gives you pause and makes you wonder whether these feelings and attitudes are appropriate or fair. But now consider a case in which the person's bad behavior is not an expression of bad values or character. She has just the values and character you would want her to have. Still, mistakes happen. Even good people screw up sometimes. One forgets to lock the gate or to pick up a carton of milk or to call one's mother on her birthday. One spills red wine on one's friend's new shirt or leaves home too late to make one's appointment on time or uses the wrong pronoun. Often, what happens in cases like this is that the victim gets angry and voices annoyance, calling the misstep to the agent's attention. And the agent quickly expresses regret, apologizing, resolving to do better next time, and trying to make it up to the person she neglected or harmed. And then, at least in cases where the harm is not great and the victim can be compensated, the people move on. 
case closed. What are we to say about the victim's initial reaction or about the agent's accountability for the offenses in these cases? Was it wrong for the victim to blame the agent for showing up late or ruining her shirt? Was the agent not accountable for being punctual or careful with her drink? I don't see anything wrong in the sort of exchange I have described. Getting angry or annoyed, blaming, seems a perfectly appropriate response to inconvenience or harm. Regret, apology, and a desire to make it up to the person one has harmed or offended seems a perfectly appropriate response to the recognition that one has messed up. Were the victim to keep blaming after the apology and penance, that would be excessive. But this is not because the agent wasn't blameworthy, but just the blame has been voiced and addressed. People are accountable, after all, for arriving at their appointments on time, running errands they have agreed to, and so on. And it is perfectly natural to get mad, maybe just a little mad, when someone one was count counting something one was counting on someone to do doesn't get done. I needed that milk for tonight's dinner. This was my favorite shirt. Such outbursts and scoldings are among the sanctions one expects when one violates these sorts of norms. That is why, in the cases I'm discussing, the violators respond as they do. In some ways, this, these exchanges seem similar to the cases of corporate responsibility I've referred to. One party violates a norm, the victim calls the violator to account, issuing an appropriately proportional and recognized sanction. The perpetrator accepts the sanctions, paying the penalty, apologizing, and cleaning up its act or in the case of DuPont, it's waterways, and everyone moves on. Moreover, in such cases, the idea that metaphysical determinism might undermine the appropriateness of such exchanges seems absurd. Not just in the corporate cases, but in the personal ones too. Surely the truth of determinism doesn't mean that I should stop expecting people to show up on time for their meetings. If there are two kinds of accountability, shallow and deep. This which suggests that the kind we are discussing is shallow. But this can't be right, because as soon as we turn to the more commonly considered cases, in which the same kinds of misbehavior are expressions of objectionable, objectionable values and characters, the worries about determinism rise up again. If there are two kinds of accountability, it can't be the case that which kind turns out to be at issue switches depending on the reasons a particular agent follows or violates a, a given norm. It can't be that when a decent person whose values and characters are fine shows up late for an appointment, she is only shallowly accountable, but when a selfish or lazy person is late, she is either deeply accountable or not at all. So I suggest that there is only one kind of accountability and that if determinism threatens our attitudes towards human mis misbehavior in a way that it does not threaten our attitudes to organizational wrongdoing, the problem must lie elsewhere. The problem arises specifically in the cases in which an individual's behavior is seen as an expression of the individual self, or more precisely, of her characters and values, and in which, due to its being seen this way, we are inclined to have certain attitudes towards her anger, resentment, indignation perhaps, and to want to blame and sanction her, sanction her in a particularly pointed way. The problem thus seems connected to what I earlier called the attributability of the act to the agent. The truth of determinism seems either to call into question the idea that the act really is attributable to the agent, or that is that the action really is an expression of the agent's self, or to undermine the idea that there can be the right kind of selves at all, selves rich enough or deep enough to warrant the kinds of reactive attitudes that we are pre-reflectively inclined to feel toward adult human beings, but not toward young children or psychopaths or corporations. I shall argue that the latter concern is the more coherent and more appropriate one to have, but I believe that the nature of that concern is usually misunderstood and so following this argument, I shall explain what I take the concern ultimately to amount to. 
How might the thought of determinism lead to either of these worries? Are either of them warranted? To explore these questions, it will be helpful to have a couple concrete examples before us. So for one example, imagine a friend who lies to you about why she can't come to your birthday party, saying that she is ill when really she just isn't in the mood. For the second example, we can consider a more serious, if less personal case. Let it be the very DuPont executive who, after calculating how much it would cost the company to build an adequate protective silo for its chemical waste, issued the order to dump it in the water, betting that the company wouldn't get caught. We have already established that determinism doesn't undermine the thought that the agents could have acted differently in such a way as to deprive them of accountability completely. It's not as if your friend had to lie whether she wanted to or not, or that the DuPont executive's hand was being guided by an unseen force in dictating that the waste be dumped in the river and the research about its probable health effects be suppressed. That is why in the case of agents whose characters and values were unobjectionable, but who had just messed up, spilling their drinks, being late to their meetings, there was nothing problematic about holding the individuals in question accountable. But in, in the cases we are now considering, our attitudes towards the agents are stronger and our judgments about them more negative. It is not just what they did that upsets us, but what their actions expressed about them. For these stronger attitudes and judgments and the harsher sanctions which they make us want to apply to their subjects to be justified, it seems something more than the ability to, to do otherwise that is compatible with determinism is required. What? The answer, it seems, must be something in the neighborhood of the ability to know better or to be better. The ability to see why their behavior was bad or wrong and to appreciate it in such a way as to lead to their acting otherwise. Your friend, knowing how much it meant to, to you to have her at your party, should have known that she should have just sucked it up and come to the party even if she didn't want to. Or at least, that she shouldn't have lied to you, pretending that illness had kept her away. And of course, the DuPont executive should have known that the risk to human health and safety takes priority over company profits and of its effect on the arc of her professional career. But the thought that these people should have known better presupposes that they could have known better, that they had, in other words, the abilities necessary to know better than they did. We didn't feel the need for these abilities in those other cases in which people of good character just screwed up. They did know better, they acknowledged as much, and they went on to apologize and compensate insofar as they could. In these cases, we do need these abilities. And the question is, is determinism compatible with them? Let us think for a minute about what we usually mean when we say that a person is able to know better than they do know, or to be better than they are. One might consult one's own history. Haven't we all done things about which we say later, I should have known better than to do them? On what basis do we make those claims? And haven't we all on occasion become better, at least in small and minor ways? What abilities were needed to bring this about? It seems to me that when I say I should have known better, what I have in mind is that I had all the information and experience, all the data, so to speak, that I needed, as well as the training and faculties of reason, reflection, imagination, and so on, to apply to the data to reach the right conclusion. I had all that it should take, in other words, to arrive at the knowledge or the appreciation or the understanding of that knowledge, that I must do one thing and not another, even though I failed actually to arrive at this knowledge at the time. So for it to be true of the DuPont executive that she should have and could have known better, what is required is that she have all the information and experience, all the training, all the faculties necessary for her to reach the conclusion that she must not put thousands of innocent people at risk in order to save corporate costs. Is it compatible with determinism that she have these things? From one perspective, it seems reasonable to reply, of course it is, why wouldn't it be? Presumably, 
everyone in this room knows that it is wrong to throw toxic waste in the river for the sake of corporate profit. And although it is not obvious precisely what experience and what faculties of thought are needed for us to have come to this knowledge, from the fact that we all have this knowledge, we can infer that we have the requisite experience and abilities to have it. Such experience and abilities are hardly exceptional. If we have these abilities, why wouldn't the DuPont executive? Barring any special extenuating circumstances then, it seems reasonable, reasonable to assume that in the ordinary sense in which we sometimes could have and should have known better than to do some of the things that we do, the DuPont executive could have and should have known better than to approve the dumping of toxic waste in the river, and your friend could have and should have known better than to lie to you about your party. And it is usually with this ordinary sense of could have, could have and should have that we are concerned when we wonder whether it is appropriate to attribute someone's failure to know better or be better than they are to them. In other words, just as the ability to do otherwise that is necessary for accountability seems compatible with determinism, the abilities to know otherwise or to have other values or to be a better person that are necessary for attributability seems compatible with determinism as well. And yet, when one focuses on the fact that if determinism is true, every thought and every impulse we have, as well as every thought and impulse that we fail to have is determined, it is hard to hold on to that perspective. There is at least an apparent tension between determinism and the thought that a person could have known better or been better in whatever sense is necessary for responsibility. If determinism is true, a person might say, then even though someone has all the intelligence and experience that would be needed to come to the right conclusion, the fact that she did not reach that conclusion, that she didn't know better or develop the right values or become a better person was not up to her. Alternatively, they might say it was not her fault or that she couldn't help it. With others, I find it tempting to make these remarks and I think there is a grain of truth in them. But I also believe that they are highly misleading with respect to their implications of a person's responsibility. The grain of truth consists in the fact that, at least in most instances, the fact that a person fails to know what we think she ought to know, or that she fails to be what we think she ought to be, or fails to value what we think she ought to value, is not under her voluntary control. One cannot make oneself understand something or acquire a virtue by an act of will. The DuPont executive who failed to appreciate the priority of human safety over corporate profit could not by an act of will have made herself appreciate it. If she was callous, as we are assuming she was, it is not because she chose to be callous, nor could she stop being callous all at once simply by deciding to change. But while these remarks give us reason not to hold the executive accountable for her moral ignorance or her moral character, they do not imply that her ignorance, her character, or her choosing to order the toxic waste to be dumped are not attributable to her. For an act or state of affairs or character trait to be attributable to an individual, remember, is for that act, state of affairs, character trait, or whatever, to express that individual's self. And at least for all that has been said so far, they do express herself. She is by stipulation, a callous, greedy person. It is an expression of her callousness that she sees how much it would cost, that seeing how much it would cost to find some other way of disposing of the company's toxic waste, she wrongly, as we know, concluded that it should just dump the waste in the river. Both her decision and her action then express her callousness and her callousness is an expression or a part of her take on the world. In so far as we express the thought that she was determined to be callous with the words, so it's not her fault that she is callous or so it's not up to her, we implicitly, I think, convert or restrict the question of the executive's responsibility into the question of her accountability for her character. In so doing, we unwittingly or perhaps wittingly shift from our initial concern about, about whether, it is un, whether it is appropriate and fair to blame and punish her 
for ordering the dumping, dumping of the toxic waste to the question of whether it is appropriate and fair to blame and punish her for being callous. But this is a mistake. So it is an interesting and difficult question to what extent an individual is accountable for her character. It is not a question that needs to be answered when wondering whether she is accountable for an action that expresses her character. Nor does that question need to be answered to determine what more specific attitudes, judgments, and sanctions are appropriate to apply to her on the assumption that she is accountable. What we need to know is not whether she was accountable for her character, but whether she, the individual who is accountable for the violation, really has a character at all. And if so, what character it is that is expressed in her action. Or to put it another way, we need to know whether she is a being with sufficient powers of active intelligence to be a self like us, to whom character traits and the behaviors they express can be attributable. Being a self and having a character at all opens her up, as it were, to the range of reactive feelings and associated judgments and responses we have towards deeply responsible beings. Which feelings and other responses we have are a function of the particular character and values that we take to be expressed in her behavior in virtue of which the behavior has the meaning and significance it does for us. For those who are still skeptical or confused about the distinction between accountability and attributability, let me try to make these points in another way, focusing this time on the less serious but more personal case of the friend who lied to you about why she did not come to your party. When you first learned of the lie, we can assume you were hurt and angry. By choosing to stay home, your friend acted selfishly. It was, and it was cowardly of her to make up an excuse. But the thought that her values and character are determined might lead to the thought that her selfishness and cowardice are not her fault or alternatively to the thought that her values and character are not ultimately up to her. Once again, these thoughts may in part be a way to register that these traits and values are not in the immediate or complete control of your friend's will. But insofar as they suggest that there is a conceivable possible world in which a person's character and values are in the control of her will and in which people's status as responsible agents would therefore be less problematic, these thoughts are misleading. When one says or thinks it is not her fault that she's selfish, this might suggest that her selfishness has been implanted or forced upon her. But this is not the way character acquisition typically works. And if it ever works this way, this is not a consequence of determinism. When one says or thinks her cowardice is not up to her, this might suggest that there is a her or a self beneath or beside her character that is being sidelined or ignored. But there is no self deeper than or separate from the cowardly person, your friend, herself. This is not to say that herself just is her character, a set of stable dispositions and values that in any given situation will react with a pre predictable response. A self is an individual existing in time. In addition to having or being a set of dispositions, values, and beliefs, she has or is a set of faculties, including perceptual faculties, rationality, imagination, and empathy, which together constitute an active intelligence with which her beliefs, values, and character interact. Assuming that your friend is a normal human being, the character she has at the time she makes up an excuse is itself partly a consequence of her exercise of these faculties. So is her reaction to the hurt and anger you feel if you let her know about them after her dissemblance to you is brought to light. The fact that our characters and our values are not in direct or complete control of our wills is a fact of life, totally independent of the truth or falsity of determinism. And at least when one is not in the grip of a train of thought set in motion by a philosophical worry about determinism and responsibility, it is hard to see why anyone would want it any other way. For a variety of reasons, I believe that when we reflect on the significance of determinism for responsibility and the appropriateness of the reactive attitudes, 
We are led along trains of thought that make us think we need powers that we don't really need and freedoms that would not actually be valuable. We overrate the importance of voluntary control. We abstract from the quality and importance of our not wholly voluntary intelligence. And we fail to appreciate the significance of the fact that both ourselves and our reactions to other selves develop, occur, and change over time. And yet, I do think there is something profoundly unsettling about the thought that every aspect of us might be determined. So far, I've been exploring a way a concern about freedom and determinism presents itself that accepts or appears to accept that if we put metaphysics to one side, we are more or less what we think we are. People with characters and values, virtues and vices that manifest themselves in the ways we behave and whom we are inclined to react to with blame and praise, criticism and admiration, resentment, indignation, gratitude, and love. These things we might be tempted to say, paraphrase, paraphrasing Strawson in Freedom and Resentment, are among the facts as we know them. They are not up for dispute. The consideration that everything about us is determined is not thought to, rent, to threaten the accuracy of these descriptions, but rather to undermine the appropriateness of or justification for our reactive attitudes and other responses. If we are determined to be the way we are, if our existence and behavior are just episodes in a chain of events stretching from before our births into a future beyond our deaths, the worry is that we are not appropriate stopping points upon which to direct our judgments and attitudes, at least not the sorts of judgments and attitudes in question. Thus, in the examples on which I've been focusing, the DuPont executive is acknowledged to be callous and the friend to be selfish and cowardly, but the thought that their vices and their consequent decisions are products of forces beyond their control makes us wonder whether it is fair to blame them for any of this. The incompatibilist concerns that I've been addressing worry that determinism undermines or breaks the natural intuitive connection between noticing that a person has a certain character trait, callousness or cowardice, for example, and harboring strong reactive attitudes towards her because of that. My remarks today, invoking the contrast between accountability and attributability, are intended to persuade you that this train of thought is misguided. But there is another way the thought of determinism might seem to undermine the appropriateness of our reactions, namely by questioning whether it is right to think of these people as having these character traits or even characters at all. I do not mean to deny that they have psychological dispositions that manifest themselves in their behavior. The DuPont executive is evidently disposed to assign little weight to considerations of the welfare of strangers in her practical decision-making. The dissembling friend is disposed to avoid uncomfortable confrontations, even at the cost of violating moral norms. Some people think of character as consisting of nothing more than a collection of such dispositions, which a given individual exhibits stably over some considerable period of time. But in order to make sense of the appropriateness or inappropriateness of our reactive attitudes to people, it is important to distinguish this shallow use of character from a more robust sense of the term. Compare our reactions to, to ordinary people with our reactions to other individuals such as sociopaths, corporations, and non-human animals who behave in superficially similar ways. Our reaction to crocodiles, for example, who will kill you at any opportunity, are very different from our reaction to trigger-happy outlaws, hitmen, and assassins. We protect ourselves from crocodiles. We try to avoid getting physically close to them, but we do not get angry at them or criticize them for being the way we, they are. As an elaboration of this point, we may say that although crocodiles are notably and thoroughly indifferent to human life, they cannot be callously indifferent. I trust that everyone will agree about this, but the question is, why can't crocodile ind indifference be callous? I believe that the answer has to do with the difference between human, at least normal adult human intelligence and crocodile intelligence. 
with the fact that while normal adult human beings are susceptible to reasons to care about human welfare, crocodiles are not. For callousness is a thick concept referring to a vice. To be callous is to be not just indifferent to human welfare, but objectionably so. And it is only objectionable to be indifferent to human welfare, as opposed to merely bad for us, in a context of susceptibility to reasons not to be indifferent. Callousness, in other words, is only possible in individuals who are capable of seeing, understanding, and appreciating reasons not to be callous. It doesn't matter for my purposes today whether you think that the judgment that one should not be indifferent to human welfare is an objective or universal moral truth, nor that you agree with me in using the term callousness in quite the way I do. What matters is that we agree that people in our present community, one that includes, for example, DuPont executives, ought to care about human welfare, that they are capable of understanding and appreciating the reasons why they ought to care. And so if they don't care, their indifference constitutes a vice. Crocodiles, incapable as they are of understanding and appreciating such reasons, or indeed I would add of having such reasons, are not part of this community, nor are they candidates for vice. Related to this, and perhaps more to the point, is the fact that when a crocodile exhibits its indifference to us, it does not constitute an insult or an affront. That is why we do not get outraged or angry at the crocodile. We just try to protect ourselves from it. The worries about determinism that I've been considering up till now were formulated in terms that took for granted that, pe that people had characters with various virtues and vices and asked whether in light of determinism, it was fair or appropriate to harbor strong reactive attitudes towards people on the basis of the characters they possess. But if attributions of character depend on a context of susceptibility to reasons for and against that character, or more precisely, for and against thoughts, desires, and values that the relevant character trait embodies, it can seem puzzling how, if determinism is true, having a character in this robust sense is even possible. Or if an individual's every thought, every feeling, every recognition of a reason, and so also every moment when she fails to recognize a reason is determined, in what sense is the individual susceptible to reasons that she does not have or see? What can we mean when we say that an individual is susceptible re to reasons she doesn't actually have? That, for example, she could have known better than to think that dumping toxic waste was in the, in the river was an okay thing to do, or that she could have known better than to stay home from your party and lie to you about it. We do not and should not require that she have been able to make herself know better by an effort of will, but mustn't it at least be metaphysically possible that she know better in a way that conflicts with determinism? When we criticize a person for not knowing or caring about something we think they should know or care about, we do so against the background assumption that they could know or care about that thing. But what does that could amount to in the context of determinism? As I said earlier, when we reflect on the occasions when we think to ourselves, I should have known better, we seem to mean by that, that we have both the intelligent faculties and the requisite evidence that would have been necessary for us to come to know it. And there were no overwhelmingly large obstructions to our exercising these faculties in conjunction with our evidence to reach the right conclusion. But there is something unsatisfying, at least something I find unsatisfying about this answer when one places it in the context of the thought of determinism. For when one exercises one's intelligent faculties to come to a conclusion, one actively goes through a process that takes them from one mental state to another in accordance with and because one sees that the conclusion is warranted. Such a process requires a kind of openness of mind. Were we restricting ourselves exclusively to the exercise of rationality, we might call it an openness to going wherever the arguments take us. 
And although I know of no argument to establish that such a process and such an openness is incompatible with metaphysical determinism, I confess that the thought of determinism makes the question of whether and how such a process is possible especially salient. The problem comes up especially when we are considering cases of epistemic, characterological, and behavioral failure, when we are thinking of someone about whom we are inclined to say that she could have and should have done or known or been otherwise and better. The thought that she was determined suggests, even though it doesn't prove, that she could not have done better, that she just is what she is, and one has simply to deal with it much as one deals with the crocodile. But if I'm right in identifying the root of the problem with a puzzle about the individual's susceptibility to reasons, then whatever doubts or puzzles we have about the appropriateness of the reactive attitudes towards the vicious or bad acting agent apply just as much to the appropriateness of reactive attitudes towards agents whom we are inclined to think of as thinking, valuing, and acting well. For the basis for doubt, if my analysis is right, is nothing more nor less than the difficulty of understanding how it is possible to think, understanding thinking to be not just the conscious experience of one damn thought after another, but the exercise of faculties of intelligence that allow us to correct our mistakes, reduce errors, and gain understanding, appreciation, and insight. Crocodiles can do none of these things, and that is why it makes no sense to resent them when they manifest indifference to our welfare. But for similar reasons, it would make no sense to love or feel grateful to a creature with the brain power of a crocodile that was hardwired to attend to and foster our interests. It is open to someone who is sympathetic to my puzzlement about how thinking in this robust sense is possible to observe that, although I have presented the puzzle as especially salient in the context of assuming the truth of determinism, the problem should strike us as equally puzzling when we assume the truth of indeterminism. Alternatively, one might suggest that it is not determinism versus indeterminism, but mechanism that seems to pose a threat to our capacity for intelligent thought. I'm inclined to agree with both these remarks, to think, in other words, that the puzzle about whether and if so, how intelligent thought is possible might come not from any particular metaphysical hypothesis, but from metaphysical thinking quite generally. Perhaps, that is, the problem will arise with any attempt to integrate a detached view of ourselves in the world with the point of view one occupies as a participant in the world as one thinking intelligent agent among others. But this does not make the problem of finding an adequate justification for our reactive attitudes or for other manifestations of taking ourselves to be deeply responsible any better. I began this lecture asking what it is about the hypothesis of determinism that seems so philosophically threatening to responsibility. In leading you through the series of reflections I have, my point has been to relocate the crux of the problem from what it has customarily been taken to be. I've been arguing that the problem is not that responsibility requires a contra-causal ability to exercise one's will free of the influence of physical and psychological laws, nor is it a problem about ourselves, our psyches, and our decisions being a product of a history that began before our births and was a fortiori outside of our control. The problem I've been suggesting is rather a problem about whether and how we can be what we think we are, intelligent beings with the capacity to understand and appreciate the world around us who express ourselves, our values, desires, hopes, attitudes, and so on in what we say and do. If the problem is not restricted to the context of determinism, but arises on any conceivable metaphysical hypothesis, so much the worse. Or perhaps, so much the better. For if I'm right that at the bottom of the worries that are sparked when we think about freedom, responsibility, and determinism is a puzzle about how it is possible truly to think, then it seems we are assured of being able to answer these worries, at least in one sense. That is, however puzzled we may be, about how intelligent thought is possible. We cannot really doubt that it is possible. 
There are in fact two sorts of arguments for this. The first, somewhat in the spirit of G.E. Moore's argument against skepticism, here's one hand, here's another, is by reminding you that we are thinking at this very moment. Or to take a somewhat longer route, let's review how we got to the worry about the possibility, possibility of intelligent thought in the first place. It was, you'll remember, the end of a train of thought focused on an individual who acted in a way we condemned, whose action was, at least so it seemed, an expression of her character. Our inclination to blame her, to be indignant and so on, reflected the fact that we saw her action as an expression of objectionable callousness or selfishness or some other vice, which we thought she should have known better and done better than to have. But the thought of determinism pulled us up short, making it puzzling whether she really could have known better. For if she was determined to have the thoughts, feelings, imaginings, and reflections she did have, it is not clear that she was susceptible to having different reasons, the reasons that would have made her less callous and that would have led to her choosing a different action. But then I pointed out that if it were really true that she couldn't have known better, in whatever sense of could should matter to us, then it is somewhat misleading to regard her as objectionably callous rather than just more neutrally indifferent in the same way, though perhaps to a less extreme degree or with a more limited scope, as crocodiles are indifferent. But if one follows the train of thought this far and comes to the, the implications of determinism or indeterm indeterminism or mechanism, as undermining the apparently callous person's capacity to be so much to so much as be callous, one should extend one's skepticism to the kind and sympathetic person, the honest person, the good friend, as well. If metaphysics undermines the vicious person's capacity to know and be better in virtue of undermining her capacity for intelligent thought, then it undermines the capacity for intelligent thought in all of us including those of us who pre-reflectively appear to be virtuous and to get things right. But surely such skepticism goes too far. For we do sometimes understand things, appreciate things, have insights, don't we? Consider such remarks as Machiavelli understands power, Henry James understands women, Otto Lenghi understands vegetables, Donald Bradman understands cricket. Aren't at least some of these statements or others like them true? If so, then we can say, again, paraphrasing Strawson, that the existence of intelligent human thought is among the facts as we know them. We may not yet understand how such a thing is possible, but that it is possible is self-evident. And so we can be sure that it is compatible with any metaphysics that has a chance of being true. I expect that most people will find this argument convincing, but if you are one of the holdouts, there is, as I mentioned, a second line of argument against this sort of skepticism as well. Rather than aiming to establish the existence of our capacity for intelligent thought, the second argument simply points out that we are incapable of doubting its existence. As the first argument parallels Moore's proof of the external world, this one seems closely related to Descartes' cogito, and perhaps even more to Kant's claim that we cannot act except under the idea of freedom. The point, obviously, is that it is self-contradictory to think that one is incapable of thought. One cannot coherently find it reasonable to conclude that one cannot find anything reasonable. Our own capacities for intelligent thought, in other words, set the limits for what we can mean by intelligent thought. So once again, we reach the conclusion that even if it is metaphysically puzzling how intelligent thought is possible, we cannot and should not doubt that it is possible. There is another way to point, put this point that connects it with my characterization early in the lecture of what it is to be a self like us. In particular, I identified being a self like us with having a point of view or sensibility or take on the world that has been formed as, and is continually open to revision by one's faculties of perception, imagination, reasoning, reflection, and so on. 
My suggestion today has been that if determinism threatens anything at all connected to our interests in freedom and responsibility, it threatens our capacity for intelligent thought. To be skeptical about our capacity for intelligent thought, however, is essentially to be skeptical about the existence of selves like us. But if you'll pardon the expression, we are us. And so a fortiori, we ourselves like us. Since determinism does not and does not and cannot threaten our existence, this implies that if my argument is right, determinism does not threaten anything at all. This is not to say that it poses no philosophical problems, just that it poses no threats. Uh, let's take a couple of minutes break. So uh, we'll be back here just shortly after five, uh, two or three minutes after five. We'll start the q and you need to pause it? Yeah, maybe to, to so see people. Never mind. Should we pause this? We need to pause, pause anyway. Sort of. <clears throat> I'll return to the meeting. Just then, uh, no, uh, let's see. We can stop the share first and then record it. Where's the next? Uh, I think this is really a question for clarification. Uh, I wasn't quite sure that I understood the latest statement of the argument, but in the last, I wasn't sure that I quite understood the latest statement of the argument, in particular, that's the last statement of the argument. So you introduced a version of what sometimes called the argument from reason. So the argument from reason is that we can't simultaneously think that the sequential components of our thought stand in rational relations if we think that they're causally determined. I think that is the argument. But this is an argument you get in uh, C.S. Lewis, for example. It's the argument against to Lewis' uh, task that appears out of the book possible world of the universe holding but the um, what I didn't understand was quite as you so I had one reply to this, which was a sort of Strasserian plan to attack the mind. So you might have something like this three different possibility of our thinking that we respond in various ways, deliberatively or to thought, adjusting the mind from another, the sort of thing that you took to be part of what it was to be a self and you know, sort of that. Um, so it's what I thought is that we, we couldn't think of ourselves as being those sort of things unless we thought that we were free thinkers that could be put about it, but our thinking is not determined. That argument, of course, doesn't show that we are free. It's just that we have to think that we are, as it were. So it's free as a presupposition, but it's not a presupposition that established freedom of our thought. It's just a presupposition that establishes in the sense we're thinking of it. What I wonder why you know, we need to embrace the stronger version of the argument, which is just to say that we can get the possibility of our thinking is prepared to be as false. Good. So, um, for the people on Zoom who might not have heard you, uh, let, me, let me repeat the question and tell me if I've got it right. But, uh, the question was that as you heard me, I was offering an argument that said, it's a precondition of our thinking that we at least believe that we're not determined. Um, that, our thinking is not determined. that our thinking is not determined, right. That our thinking is not determined. Um, and your question was, why not embrace the stronger conclusion that because we are thinking and it's a precondition of our thinking that it, Determinism is false. That determinism is false. That was that was your question, right? Yeah, I just wasn't sure whether you wanted to read the conclusion of it, but, but if you think that the argument is wrong, I mean that's what you're trying to get by. Why not run to the street while it's born and the state of the truth of determinism is false? Right. So my I actually didn't mean to say we have to think that we're not determined. 
Um, what I meant to say is that, uh, that though we don't understand how thinking is compatible with determinism, or for that matter, as I put in a, a kind of peripheral point, how our thinking is compatible with indeterminism or mechanism, right? Though we don't understand how thinking is possible, uh, we can't doubt that it is possible because to take one form of the argument, here we are thinking, right? <laughs> um, and to take the other form of the argument, we can't think that we're not thinking without contradicting ourselves. So the point is we have to accept that we're thinking. And if the problem that determinism seems to give us is that it makes thinking impossible, that there must be a mistake in that appearance. And so that's why I, what I wanted to do was shift from uh, if determinism, I wanted to do first, uh, you know, make the point that, as you say, has been made before that, look, it's not the ability to do otherwise, it's the possibility of thought that is the real concern here. And then I wanted to shift from thinking, uh, you know, from the view that, um, you know, what, once you had seen that, then I guess the point is, since we can't doubt that we can think, meta, no metaphysics can actually undermine responsibility. That is, if, if the problem that, make, that make, makes metaphysics seem to threaten responsibility is the possibility of thought, then we've misunderstood our own problem. And I'm leaving us then with the puzzle, how is thinking possible? I can't answer that question, but I'm not worried that determinism is in some way gonna undermine it. Is that, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so I was asking about the role of organizations in the argument. So you start with this initial intuition, organizations are responsible. And then I thought you said um, they're accountable, not trivial. And I thought that's why you think when you want to talk about the executive, not the organization itself. Um, right? But it seems like, so my initial question is, don't organizations have characters and self? And isn't BP horrible and callous? And is that sort of kind of wrong? So why do you think that? Way? But then later on, when you introduce this between Shallow and this robust character, maybe that's a little bit of Shallow and robust. But then the Shallow character can be the crocodile example. And we know it's the organizations like how it's the crocodiles, right? I mean, like the, then your initial intuition is gone because the initial intuition, you don't see crocodiles in the way that people organizations according to your initial intuition. Right. So what, where do organizations fall off the train in, in terms of these different kinds of responsibility you have done it and why? Uh, good, thank you. Um... So though this is not an excuse, I I'm I can I might mention that this is actually the last in a series of papers <laughs> that um, and some of the earlier ones put the corp put the relation between corporations and crocodiles together in a in a way that it, it hadn't occurred to me has fallen off the um, uh, the content of the of the talk. Um, so it was a very clear, your question was very clear in pointing out, look, there's a, there's one way in which we can talk about corporations having a character, that's the shallow way. So, right, you're absolutely right that my concern, well, you know, I started with, you know, corporations are accountable, but, um, right, but not because they have selves like us, right? And so that's to say, just shallow. Um, and then when I was trying to explain the difference between shallow and uh, robust, I used crocodiles rather than corporations. Uh, so, but, so the, but I think, look, here's a difference between crocodiles and corporations, very interesting for other purposes. Crocodiles aren't accountable for anything because they don't have 
the capacity for rational deliberation, you know, mere rational deliberation, right? Uh, corporations can, they can say, look, I know these are the laws. I know that if I get caught, I'll have to pay these damages. It's worth it for our profits to take the risk of getting caught in order to avoid more costs. So they can do kind of instrumental practical deliberation, which is all it takes to make them accountable. This is, this is all we need in order to say, if you, you know, if you dump toxic weight, we're gonna fine you to, you know, for billions. Uh, crocodiles can't do that, right? So we say cor corporations are responsible in a way, but not the way people are, right? And usually, as I say, the, uh, the literature as I'm familiar with it says, because that's not real accountability, there's this other kind. And my point is actually the accountability is the same, it's something else. So um, now have I lost your question or have I answered it? I can't. <laughs> You know, I disagree that there are those differences between organizations and individuals. Organizations are like crocodiles in being shallow, in right, in, in that they're shallow, therefore not accountable, not, not attributable in the way in which things are attributable to us. Now, but I should say, look, if you want, I mean, Collective agency or group agency, it's a, it's a really tough subject, I, a fascinating subject. I'm willing to change my minds about that subject. Um, what seems really solid to me is that the fact that determinism is true will not get Boeing off the hook. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous to think, oh, determinism is true, so corporations shouldn't be held accountable for what they do. If you hold that fixed, then, then that would be a way of saying, and therefore determinism isn't the problem with, you know, uh, with accountability, it's a, gotta be a different problem. So we could actually skip, you know, most of the middle of the paper if you wanna go there and not accept that they're different. Thanks so much. So, um, I was interested in the development of intelligence this plan. And, and the, and the idea is that determinism implements intelligence. Intelligence is necessary for a certain kind of character, so it's necessary for a certain kind of uh, attributability. And I think I was just not clear on why intelligence would be really necessary for character and Way why so there's the, the distinction between the crop and the kidney has to do with reasons responsiveness. And I guess it seems to me that like, you know, my dog can be responsive to reasons, uh, people with developmental disabilities can be responsive to reasons. People with what you know, developmental disabilities yes. can be responsive to reasons. And I was thinking that there's certain some kind of reasons you really need to human grade uh intelligence in order to be responsive to those reasons. And I was just hoping you could say something about it, those. Work. Yeah, good. Um, so, I guess what um, what's important to me is that, I, um, first of all, responsiveness to reasons. I mean, that's a philosophical term of art. Um, it's important to me to dis, to to insist that. That there are different kinds and qualities of responsiveness to reasons, and that rationality, understood as kind of the ability to engage in instrumental reasoning or to do logic, you know, uh, is not enough to be a self like us. There's all kinds of other things em empathy, imagination, perceptual sensibilities. Um, and that a lot of those figure in to what we take for granted in um, when we react to people with reactive attitudes. Uh, the point you're making that look, your dog has some of that and that people with developmental disabilities, some, de some developmental disabilities, other kinds of mental illness 
um, or disorders uh, are responsive to reasons. I totally want to accept and say, yeah, they can have characters. They can be responsible in the sense, especially in the attributability sense, in, you know, perhaps in low, you know, in specific ways and not in other ways. I mean, all of us are responsible in some ways and not in other ways. Um, so I want to put that on board. I guess I'm thinking they have intelligences. I mean, I'm identifying intelligence more with a, um, uh, a more pluralistic conception of reasons responsiveness than with the kind of thing that IQ tests or, or college entrance exams are gonna capture. So in a way, I think um, uh, this is a friendly suggestion that what's, what's relevant to attributability is not, um, is not restricted to people with, you know, well, it's not necessarily restricted to people or in particular to people with high levels of kind of instrumental rational capacities. There are all, all kinds of capacities that are relevant. Is that? Okay, so we have a question here on Zoom, which I'm going to read out. So this is from Kevin Berryman. Uh, Kevin asks, I am interested to know Buster Wolf's take on Buddhist theories of no self in light of her account of responsibility being attributable to one's real self. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't know enough to really know what I, you know, to have a good answer to that. I, I mean, it's, it's a fair question. Uh, um, it, It, it may be that if you take, I mean, um, one way of understanding um, the implications of Buddhism or responsibility itself is undermined. I mean, that is why well, worry about responsibility. Um, but then there's another way in which I think, look, insofar as you, um, you think, look, there's, there's a certain way I ought to live. There's certain things I ought to do. I ought to be, you know, kind to the people around me. I mean, there are at least, you know, many versions of Buddhism in which there is a way, you know, there are oughts in their way of looking at things. Um, then it seems to me all of this comes back again. Well, if, you know, if you ought to do these things, then you might hold yourself accountable to them. And so, you know, I'm I'm not sure how how my talk of the self should be interpreted, and you know, does it really conflict with kind of no self views? Probably it does, but I I don't really know enough to you know, to know how to answer that responsibly. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd like to move to the movie, but I wonder if there was another way to uh, mitigate the threat of which I maybe to break the link between the movie and the ability of, uh, to know better. So, so the thought is this that um, in order for something to express my deepest values and factor, it doesn't have to be that you know uh, those values and factors could be revised. All that's required is that you know it's deeply how uh, that I deeply hold them, and then my actions will inform my deeply. Out there. And indeed, you know, I think that uh, certain, it's, it's good evidence that uh, certain values are really deep, that it's really immune to a bit of on my part, because, you know, I, I can't entertain any other kind of value. So I just wonder what we thought about that we are going to uh, sort of answer the better Thanks. Um, yeah, well, so it'd be good to work through this with a specific example. I. Um, My thought was, look, there's a way in which you could, I mean, you could have some value in a way that was very deep in the sense that it was immune to change. It was, um, you know, that could be hardwired, right? You could, um, or it could be a result of some, you know, psychic, um, you know, barrier. Like I, I cannot doubt what my parents taught me, you know, because of some kind of psychic relationship to your parents or something. 
Um, I think in a case like that, that's, that is more like um, a disorder or a, you know, that's, it turns into a superficial, it's a, it's a superficial kind of character. I mean, it's, it's deep in the sense that it's not, it, it's immune to change, but reactive attitudes based on, a, on those things doesn't seem justified. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess like um, if, if the person has certain setting order attitudes that draws these attitudes, uh, so I, I guess I'm not thinking so much of uh, you know disorder kind of thing, but the person is aware that they have these values and to fully endorse their those are uh, uh, you know good times to have let's say so I, I'm wondering like you know is there is it open there to say at least well again I, it depends on whether at the second order their, the things, the basis for their endorsement of the first order is susceptible to reason. So, uh, you know, this is, I mean, this is connected to my point that instrumental rationality isn't enough to give us, to make us a self like us. The ordering, the ability to have second order and third order values isn't, I think enough to be a self like it isn't enough and it isn't necessary but right to be a self like us you need this kind of susceptibility to, to understanding and appreciating which requires that one at least in theory be capable of change that's right thank you um okay we have another question on Zoom, so this is from uh, Parker Peritin. Uh, so the question is, why not say that our character and values are under our indirect control, and that our voluntary actions are under our direct control? This distinction could provide reason to think that one is able to act and control one's character, and thus what arises from one's character and values, such as the statements of the white class and very to the party, are still attributable. Uh, read that again. So well, why not say, I guess the, the important part, why not say that our character and values are under our indirect control and that our voluntary actions are under our direct control? So what's the between direct and indirect control? Direct control of voluntary actions and our character and values and indirect control. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of things that could be said about that. Um, but I think the important part is that there's a lot of things that could be said about that. So this distinction could provide reason to think that one is able to act and control one's character. Um, and what arises from one's character, such as um, uh, a mistake is going to white class, to attend the parties, the things that might not have said, so maybe so. Um, so those are attributable to what indirectly, because they're responsible for one's character and what's indirectly responsible for one's character. So I'm, um, I don't want to get too pedantic about this, but my thought is that you are in, you are, your character is attributable to you, period. I don't need anything about voluntary control there. I mean, what I need is susceptibility to reasons, but that's, but being susceptible to reasons doesn't mean that you can control which reasons are actually gonna be appreciated by you, right? It just means that there's nothing stopping you. From, so, I mean, I'm thinking about cases where well, so one thing that um, many people are familiar with is you hear an argument, an argument for vegetarianism, perhaps, and you and you think, well, it sounds like a good argument, but it doesn't convince you, and you don't become a vegetarian. Then you hear it again, and it doesn't convince you, but then eventually it does convince you. I mean, eventually somehow it, you know, it sort of sits with you for a while, and you change. I mean, the same thing happens. I mean. With many cases in which our values or our sense of, of how to behave has changed over time, um, you, it takes more than one you know, presentation of, the, of an argument. It might not be an argument at all that finally gets to you. And I feel like, look, I can't control whether it will get to, you know, whether I will get it. And if so, when I will get it, all I can do is, you know, cultivate general virtues of openness. So I just don't think our character is in our voluntary control, but I don't think that's a problem for attributability. The question you read out to me 
sounds like the questioner might be really thinking about trying to make you accountable for your character. And you could do that. I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people do want to argue you're accountable for your character because there's in, you know, there's certainly input to our um, to our efforts and our will and um, and so on. But I guess once the distinction between accountability and attributability is um, once you fully buy into that, I think like, you know who cares about being accountable for? I mean. It's not as if I want to punish somebody for being callous. I want to punish her for dumping the toxic waste in the water. And that I can do as long as she's capable of controlling her action and has what it takes to know better. So that, so um, I hope that, that helps explain my position. Mark, does that answer or speak to your question or did you want to follow up at all? Okay, he says yes. Thank you. Thanks. I really enjoyed all this. I want to ask about organizations as well. Um, I decided the question of the staff just uh, I thought it was interesting. So I'll get to I wasn't sure how I was supposed to feel about determinism and Amazon and those things. Um, really? oh. But uh, <laughs> I was sort of puzzled because I feel like sometimes what is attitude, maybe this is the way you think. Like uh, culpable organizations always require uh, culpable individuals, and uh, I'm excited about this idea that maybe uh, organizational culpability could be sort of sui generis. You know, lots of individuals get together, and the organization is this point that that would be really interesting. But I was just wondering how you're thinking about that because, like, my initial thoughts like. like Determinism defeats the culpability of the individual for the purposes of appears to uh, you know you expect it to be you know, like, you know, as well. Uh, and I, I know like this experience of this thing about bring which kind of talk us through way of thinking about connections between culpability and right. Um well I do feel like it's uh the subject of organizational responsibility is one that um, I've thought about some, but not enough to feel totally um, confident about my views. Um, many times, uh, if, if an organization does something awful, there are individuals that you can pinpoint who have done awful things that have together made it happen that the organization as a whole would. It doesn't seem to me that it always happens that way, that somehow the organizational structure can be such that without anyone, any individual being particularly bad, it is worked out that something really bad happened. Um, so the question is, how is, how is the kind of micro uh, explanation of how a, bit, a really bad thing happens when an organization does something relevant to holding the organization accountable for the bad thing. And my thought was not relevant. Um, I mean, it is, as I said, it could be relevant whether it was in the power of the organization as a whole to know what they were doing, to do differently. I mean, I took examples which you know, evidence shows they didn't know what they were doing, they could have done differently. Um, you know how this divides into individual culprits, uh, I'm, I don't know. Um, but, the, but in a way I thought the fact that we don't worry about those things when we decide um, you know, to boycott Facebook or, you know, or you know, anything like that is a sign of the fact that accountability that you know, just doesn't require um, this kind of emotional stuff. A accountability isn't, at, at the beginning of the paper, I said, look, I think it was when I said, people think there are two kinds of accountability. One kind is just pragmatic. It's a tool for social 
um, uh, providing incent, you know, incentive for, for organizations and human beings, including sociopaths, right, to stay between certain lines. Um, you know, we say we'll threaten, you know, we'll punish you if you don't do this. And it, it's just instrumental and it doesn't. Um, and I guess what I'm thinking is that is what accountability is for everyone. We don't think so because we mix accountability and attributability together when we're looking at human beings, particularly human beings whose bad actions are expressions of a bad set of values or bad choices rather than the ones who just screwed up. We think um, accountability is accountability for their callous toxing of, you know, callous dumping of the waste. Well, where I'm thinking, look, there's accountability for dumping the waste. And the fact that it was a result of callousness makes us angrier and wanting to, you know, sanction more, but that actually has nothing to do with the accountability. So that, that's my thought. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to um, ask about this claim that uh, uh, we're, it's either impossible to think that you are not thinking or that there's something coherent about thinking that you're not thinking, right? Because one thing, uh, actually, there are these kind of very coherent ways that you could uh, identify yourself, right? So uh, it doesn't even sort of need to require any sort of separate confusion. Or you might think I just need uh, like misleading evidence about the consequences. Right? So imagine I've got this uh, guru. My guru tells me that uh, whenever I have a feeling in the door, I'm going to be filled with a sense of peace and oneness with the world. Right? So I'm going around and I'm having lots of thoughts, but I'm not being filled with a sense of peace and oneness with the world. And so just guru, I think, well, I'm not thinking. Right? It, it, that, it, like, it might be far fetched, but it doesn't seem like any way incoherent. So I was thinking, like, like, it wasn't obvious to me that it was impossible. And then you might think, okay, well, that doesn't matter. Right? What matters is that thinking of your thinking is this sort of state which has its own property that whenever you're in it, it's uh, you're guaranteed to be thinking something true. Right? And I think that's what matters. Um, I was thinking, for your argument, it seemed like that what is really important is that we are always in a position to know that I was thinking that really the fact that uh, this state is so appropriate, it isn't obvious that that's going to guarantee the world is in a position. But my guru is like really reliable, everything else he's told me has uh, turned out to be true. I think I've got really good in receiving evidence uh, that I'm not thinking, right? And if you think that knowledge requires something more than just using the right tool mechanism of things, that it's incompatible with having really good in receiving evidence, I think like it, well. I can get myself in a sort of state where I'm not going to be in a position. So I was just thinking. So um, I, I appreciate this, uh, this question in part because I, my argument at the end was, look, there are two ways you could respond to the, um, the suggestion that if determinism is true, intelligent thought is impossible. One is to say, well, that's obviously a fallacy because here, here I am thinking intelligently, right? Um, that would be, that's the sort of G.E. Moore-like thinking. And, um, and the other is to say, um, I can't coherently uh, doubt that I'm thinking. So, right. So it, you don't have to know that you're thinking. What you have to, what you have to think, is that it, on the second view. I mean, what you have to realize is, I can't coherently think that I'm not thinking because as soon as I, um. As I find myself trusting my guru, I am trusting myself to be thinking, which is inconsistent with what my guru told me I should be doing, right? 
Why don't we just use it? Well, otherwise you wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't find your guru, you know, what you're doing is you're saying, my guru told me this, therefore this, right? That's thinking, right? That's, you're, you're thinking, aren't you? So, so you're like taking your guru to have, if I'm, on the basis of what he said, you reach a conclusion with your mind. It's not just a, um, it's not just a, an effect, it's a thought that responds to your guru. Right. So, so I Aren't you thinking when you... Oh, no, no, I agree that if I trust my guru and I, I come to believe I'm not thinking... Yes, um, that you've been thinking. I'm going to be wrong. Right? Oh, okay. So I mean, I could be acting perfectly coherent. My guru has been reading the Bible so far. There are other false, false beliefs, but everyone agrees that I do not have coherent false beliefs. And in this case, my guru is saying it's going to be really good evidence that I don't have to mark this of thinking. So I've got really good evidence that I'm not thinking with this and other things. Something incoherent that I might I think the guru is going to be really good reason. Um, maybe someone else would like to jump in here. It seems to me incoherent to believe you're not thinking as a result of thinking when you recognize that it had to be a result of thinking. So then, you know, I won't recognize that thinking. That's the thought, right? I, I think thinking tells this being in this particular state that I can identify and not think. Well, I, oh, I look, there's one possibility of just using the word think thought differently from the way we're using it in this room to say, um, you so know. So I, I, I just think when you, I, I've got confused and I think that when you think you have this other sensation as well, I can want it, but I know I don't have that. So then I think that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, okay, I was just thinking, oh, I, I was thinking about the other day, right? We need to have that distinction here. So some nice people trying to figure out how to solve that, you know, like all the desires of power. You would not have to look sorry, like when we would go like try to make sense of surprise all the desire of this without uh I, I feel like there's like a lot of the government desires that they know and then their conception of knowledge might come in and that drives us too long. And then another way to be the government desires this thing that actually is knowledge. So maybe you know, that's the distinction like the guru loads you with this concept. No, no, that sounds. It's uh, the Zoom question. Okay, so we have a question over Zoom from uh, Tyler Molar. You want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? We're having a bit of trouble hearing you. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. That was that was very interesting, and I agree with your analysis. And I Are like you able to speak up? I can't hear you. Okay. Um, I'm speaking as loud as I can. It's a little better. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for the talk, and it was. Uh, I agree with it. I agree with your analysis, and I agree with your conclusions. Uh, I arrive at them at a slightly different, in a slightly different way, and I'd like to ask your opinion about that. In the physical domain, determinacy or indeterminacy, if you have to, if you happen to be a quantum physicist, uh, is is obviously the case. Neither of those, as you correctly identify, neither of those have anything to say about thinking and about being accountable or attributable. They don't apply. So uh, I think what does apply is whether there is or isn't some kind of dualism, Cartesian dualism. If we don't have dualism, then any kind of thinking, rational thinking, agency, whatever it is, none of that is possible. So I like to think of the system as artificial intelligence. I think I am artificially intelligent. I'm not artificially intelligent in the sense that alpha zero is artificially intelligent. I'm much more artificially intelligent than that. 
with current technology to build a computer that's artificially intelligent enough to be like me, I'd need a computer the size of a city. I need 100 billion neurons and so on. Um, so now I don't understand how intelligent such an artificial intelligent machine might be, but it's good enough for me. I was born an unprogrammed artificial intelligence machine and I've been conditioned and programmed and I've learned from my experiences for the last many decades. So I'm now programmed, if you like, or primed or conditioned to think the way I think. And that makes me what I am. I don't need more than that. I don't want to think of myself as thinking. I think that kind of dualistic thinking doesn't exist. For us to think that we are thinking is an illusion. It's purely an illusion. And, and, and what we're really doing is information processing. And we process information, we respond to the DuPont executive that, that dumps the toxic waste into the river, and we respond as we are primed to do. So everything is, is, is an, it's all an automatic process. We are all, if you like, chemical robots to put the uh, simplistic term on it. And, and uh, being a, a self like us is, is an illusion. There's no such thing as being a self like us. And when we say that uh, we, we think people are selves like us, if they could have done differently, well, we would have done differently if we would have been in that position, but we weren't. They were, and they wouldn't have and couldn't have done differently because they're conditioned the way that they are. So maybe the error is in the expectation that other people would act or could have acted differently. They could have only acted differently if it was me and not them. The whole system is perfectly deterministic, and I find nothing mysterious about any of this. And for me, this even avoids a necessity or a call for a distinction between accountability and attributability. Uh, rational thought is just logical information processing, as far as I'm concerned. Now, what am I missing? I'll ask, ask you to wrap up the question now so we can uh, answer more things for a point on time. Uh, were you able to follow? Um, were you able to hear that? Um, I heard large parts of it, but not, but not every bit of it. But I can try to answer one. I, I think I might be able to hear it correctly. That uh, one of the key suggestions was that we're not in fact thinking that, that the schoolism is necessary for that, and, um, and schoolism is not true. We're processing information like for people to focus. Right. And so we need that new way of thinking about ourselves. Right. So. Um, I mean, this is actually, you know, there's a way in which I take this question to be related to the last question about, you know, what's the problem with thinking that I'm not thinking or, um, and also perhaps gives me a better answer to the question about Buddhism, which is, um, which is, I, I mean, I reject this idea that to be, at one point, the questioner said, there are no selves like us to, you know, it's an illusion to be a self like us. But my thought is, wait, that's, that that was inconsistent. I mean, I, here I am, I exist. So I, you know, and, and I define the like us, or we define the like us. So we're here, we're something. Um, the questioner himself agrees we're here and something. And is saying, we're not selves like us, we're artificial intelligences. But I think, well, if we're artificial intelligences, then it turns out that selves like us are artificial intelligences, or not artificial, literally. But I have not, you know, I don't have a, um, a stake in whether artificial intelligences can eventually be, um, be built or created that would become selves like us. I, I don't, you know, the selves like us doesn't have to be biological. They have to have certain psychological properties. Again, you could say, well, psychological properties are an illusion. But if so, then this whole, you know, the whole worry about responsibility is 
within the kind of dream world <laughs> that, you know, that the questioner doesn't care about. I mean, I guess I take the problem of free will and determinism to come from within um, a world in which we relate to each other as one intelligent being among others. And the question is, when we think about the metaphysics of what we are, we get puzzled about, you know, whether what we can think, what we are, what we take to be true of us can be true. And I, right, so the point of the paper was to identify what it is that could possibly be threatened by metaphysics and to come until we get to the point that what's, that there is no coherent uh, thing that can be threatened. All we can be is puzzled, not threatened. Okay, um, so I wanted to ask a question that is maybe going to come from the opposite direction from some of the previous ones. Uh, so, in particular, I wonder what you thought about um, a more uh, robust view, robust character, or, or in particular, a teleological view of robust character that um, kind of starts with the kinds of things that we are um, and, and sees uh, persons or human persons as. Having an inbuilt uh, telos where like our ultimate selves are aimed at a particular kind of good. Maybe this is like what, like why it makes sense to talk about us about us as being susceptible to certain kinds of reasons because like we're oriented towards a certain kind of origin or rationality or that's you know whatever it is. Um, and then um, because we are uh, we're of this time, then actions that are in conflict with that aren't oriented for the telos that are contrary to our true, our true self and so aren't free of essence. So it's kind of like a, um, I think you got this idea in terms of Plato um, and uh, in the Christian tradition that, you know, like any act that is, is evil or is, is uh, you know, not oriented for our good, it's not free in some sense because it's contrary to that true self. Uh, so I wonder if that's a way of developing your view or if you have kind of false thought that you have what you do with that, uh, with that kind of view. Um, I haven't, I haven't thought much about that view. Um, I guess my question, I don't particularly want to develop my view with the idea that there's a true self that's common to any human being or, right? I mean, I sort of, I think there are faculties that we, that we value that are, that are relevant to the way we relate to each other as, I mean, the practices of responsibility, the reactive attitudes that we tend to have um, are grounded on assumptions of certain psychological capacities and faculties. I don't think there's a telos that's necessary for that. Um, that said, I, I guess there's a question. I, um, is there anything incompatible with the things I've said and a view like that? So, and offhand, I don't see one, but I mean, so you might think having this view about a human telos um, can combine with my view in a, in a way that um, answers certain puzzles in a, I mean, in a good way, that would be fine with me. I, don't, I mean, I don't see any reason to reject it, but it um, doesn't seem to me necessary. But do you have a follow-up for that? Or? Well, that's not possible to me, but it's, it's compatible that you can solve it different way. Thank you very much. Just going back to character, um, there are a number of other notions of a somewhat distinct character, somewhat So we might talk about something personality, for example. Mm -hmm. We might talk about their demeanor. We might talk about their temperament. We might talk about their appetites and such like. And there's a sort of cluster of notions here. I think there's two features I think a lot of people can be relevant. One is they're all evaluated in some. They're all evaluated. They're all evaluated. They're all evaluated. They're all Not necessarily in the sense of responsibility. I just think you can say that's a rather unpleasant characteristic of that person, you know, but it's probably nothing to do about it. So it's not. <laughs> but it does seem to me that if you think about the range of things I just mentioned, you can order them in terms of something like that. Something, depth, like, something depth. like depth. Okay. Like, I want to say that sort of temperament is shallower than character. 
I mean, I would try to what we do on the right now, but it seems to be as possible on the right. One way of, of indicating what depth means in this context would be to do with malleability. So you might say something like this you know, people actually can swim to that and sort of get that under control in certain ways. Or let's put this way it's more important to people who can manage their temperament than they might be able to manage their personality, or they might think that this personality is more open to being transformed into a character. And it doesn't quite matter which. You want to take as deep as so I'm trying to think of how it is deeper than personality, and personality people can tend to make people continue this way. But the point is that one way of measuring this is in terms of malleability. That seems very possible. But what makes something deeper is it's or, or, I don't say what makes it deeper, but what's connected with its being deeper is it's harder to change. Whether harder to change for the agent or hard to change for an ex for an outsider is a matter. So anyone who's involved in education, for example, or a clinical psychology or any of these fields is concerned with these characteristics and does believe that they're subject to transformation in fairly systematic ways. I mean, there are limits and all the rest and so on. So we can talk about character too. And obviously, um, Aristotle is concerned about the extent to which it's possible for us to acquire virtue. Now, of course, he thinks there are predisposing character teachers and so on, but he does think that we have some control over the question of the um, So I wasn't quite sure whether you wanted to say that, for example, another extent to this, that these are not the sort of things for which we're morally responsible, or that just some, where there may be degrees of responsibility. You don't have the word moral, you didn't have the word to defer that, but um, the degrees of maybe just degrees of degrees. Um. Yeah, so what my, as I mentioned, this is um, the last of a series of talks. The middle one is of character and agency. And I, and I talk about the difference between character and personality and the whole set of one's psychological um, dispositions and, and so on. Um, wanting, in my case, to use character as I, um, as I have in this paper, as connected to cells like us, the idea being that only cells like us can have characters, but I'm, um, that crocodiles don't have characters. I, we can leave it open whether corporations can have characters. I mean, I'm thinking about the robust sense, right? Um, it, you're right, that there, that, that there are lots of beings that have psychologies that can't have characters, right? Because having a character is, um, well, so I wanna use the word deeper actually. However, unlike you, I don't want to identify depth with resistance to change. I, um, I mean, you wouldn't call something a part of someone's character unless it was, it, it was pretty stable and, and, um, you know, went on for a long time, maybe, maybe even resistant to change in some ways, but um, it seems to me what's really important about, about character in connection with responsibility is that it's susceptible to change. That if we, you know, that if it's just, if it's something rigid, right, um, then you're not responsible for that. You can't, you know, if, if there's nothing that could shift that or get someone to see it things differently, then I mean, if I don't care how you use the word, I mean, you can use the word character for that if you want, but then responsibility doesn't include that. Um, so I, you know, would want to make a distinction between like a phobia, right? For example, does not seem to me to be a part of one's character. Though it might be very resistant to change, right? Um, so, right. So, I appreciate being more uh, uh, finely uh, attentive to the differences between temperament and character and personality, but um, the susceptibility to reasons, which is not, as I say, not under our voluntary control, not something like you're easily susceptible to reasons, can be really hard to change. But if you can't, if, if there's nothing in terms of 
And in, if you can't change through intelligent, the intelligent faculties, then it's not part of the character as I want to use that term. Okay. 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 Okay.